Well, hello everyone. Um, at first I was actually sort of debating whether or not to start off this stream slash discussion slash video or whatever this turns into uh, without an image, but um, since I've appeared on other streams with my face, I thought it would be pointless to sort, to sort of try to remain anonymous behind a wall of jellyfish at this point. Um, I will say that I, uh, I know my lighting is horrible. I have deliberately made it look spooky and interesting on purpose. But that, I can assure you, um, I'm going to try and be as uh, not spooky as possible with the facts I'll be presenting. Or rather, just the um, very acute observations I will be sort of pointing out. Now, I think that the, um, the reality of what we're kind of dealing with here is not so much people not being armed with the skills to detect falsehood or potential misinformation, but rather... What we're dealing with is a deliberate campaign by academics, by the government, by teachers, to willfully spread a very specific narrative about nature. Now, in my first video, I, I kind of discussed how sort of there are suppositions being made about kind of what's going on um, in our society, about really the kind of things that we are seeing happening in our day-to-day -day lives in terms of how we're being led astray. You know, these, these tiny moments of, oh, wow, you know, maybe I should just look up what's going on recently and then see, oh, man, there's all of this information getting thrown in my face. You know, what am I supposed to believe? Now, if you're someone like an animator or if you're someone like a janitor or you work in the fast food store or your main goal in life is to learn a trade um, or maybe you're just big into one specific subject in academia. But no matter who you are, there's a certain level of trust that goes into academia. And that trust is mostly predicated on the fact that, for the most part, there's a lot of science out there that is very easily replicable. And I can get into the replication crisis or something at, or at another time. Maybe I'll just mention it now so, to get it out of the way. But there are very prominent scientists out there who willfully admit that at least two thirds of studies published, and if not even that number, at least half of studies published have issues with their methodology, or they have good methodology, but they're relying on metadata that maybe had issues in terms of its ultimate collection. Um, I'm gonna get more into things like surveying and whatnot later. Uh, I don't think it's very pertinent to the discussion I wanna have today. But today is gonna start off with a pretty big bombshell. Now. This is called a critique through history for a reason. Uh, history begins, for all intents and purposes, uh, with the earliest creatures we can find in the fossil record. Uh, these creatures are found predominantly in the oldest rock we can find, typically continental rock, for the sole fact that this is so long ago that most other life at that time had already been subducted under geothermal plating. That's how long ago it was that the earth w whose plates move at the speed that your fingernails grow have moved so much plate material that most other life that existed at that time that we could have had record of simply does not exist in the rock that it was potentially fossilized in. This is the time span we are talking about, and it's ultimately mind boggling that we have what we have. But if you look at the fossil record, something no scientist will dispute. You will see life emerging in a window that, according to some fossil finds in Canada, um, or if you go more official, happened somewhere between 400 to 550,000 years after a period called the Great Bombardment, uh, upon which the Earth cooled and life suddenly emerged. Statistically speaking, an almost impossible task. And today I'm going to sort of talk about why sort of that is, you know, what has to go on to make a cell work. Now, in my previous installment of this series, my initial installment talking about abiogenesis, I didn't necessarily mention anything deep and complex in cells. In fact, I noticed sometimes I accidentally made errors. Um, I will try to make as few errors as possible in this video. This will actually be a bit of a dive uh, into the cell mechanics, and today I'm going to specifically refer to the ribosome to make my point. Now, why is the ribosome important? The ribosome is important because it's the apparatus within your cell, or within all cells, basically, because um, there are bacterial ribosomes. That is in charge of D is basically in charge of protein synthesis, taking in DNA, 
you know, it takes in, it takes an R. Okay, so, all right, that was weird. Um, but it's taking, you know, you have D DNA. That DNA now has to be transcribed. You know, they have to go through the process of taking this DNA and fundamentally converting it into a equal portion of RNA. You know, the, the main thing is that it doesn't, you know, it has uracil in it instead of, you know, the standard, you know, th thymine and all that other good stuff in the cell. It has, it has a different function. It's a ribonucleic acid instead of a deoxyribonucleic acid. But its main function is to carry that information from that DNA outside of the cell or outside of the uh, nucleus. Again, I'm already misspeaking. But uh, it carries it outside of that nucleus. And what happens is that it heads to the ribosome. Now, how does a ribosome work? Well, the main function of a ribosome is for protein synthesis or mRNA translation. mRNA is messenger RNA. That's the RNA that is speeding its way to that ribosome, basically, to, well, let's, let's just say be transcribed or chained up into a, a protein. But of course, the process is not that simple. Um, in the course of chaining up that protein, a lot of things have to happen. First of all, uh, there are two major components to a ribosome. Uh, these are mostly a, a group of, you know, RNA themselves that are bound up with a series of proteins. Um, the main question that we have to answer is, so ribosomal RNA and ribosomal proteins are R proteins are the constituent molecules that make up the ribosome. Now, something had to have happened. Something, you know, major must have happened in order to lead to this development. And I understand that there are other ways of protein synthesis, but it contains another type of RNA as well. So you have ribosomal RNA, messenger RNA, as well as something called tRNA or transfer RNA. These RNA are basically carrying the amino acid and slotting in to the messenger RNA strand. Now the process of translation and transcription are incredibly complex. Today I'm basically just going to talk about um, protein synthesis as it applies specifically with messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and of course the ribosomal RNA. This discussion is solely going into the ribosome to save everybody time. Now, all of this buildup, all of this, you know, tech, tech issues and awkward uh, tangents ties into the fact that where did all of this RNA come from? The, the fact that just this one mechanism of the cell works uh, brings up an issue that many people who are skeptical of a Darwinian evolutionist model of where we came from in this universe kind of bring up. And that's that. How do you get three forms of RNA doing different tasks like this? How does this structure emerge through purely random processes and natural selection? You know, I mean, one could even go and type into the internet bacterial ribosome. And, and literally the moment I type it up, you get these massive structures of RNA and RNA protein bound up into these massive, look at it, it go on right now, type in bacterial ribosome into DuckDuckGo or Google, whatever you use, and you'll be presented with these very incredible, miraculous looking macromolecules that are just mind boggling to look at. It's, it's, it looks so cool. But how does that emerge in the first cell how does that appear randomly in the first cells you can't convince me that protein synthesis is not a crucial part of maintaining a cell's homeostasis in order for a cell to function it has to maintain homeostasis it has to constantly be replacing things that break down and not only that it needs to make its own living space more hospitable so what role do proteins play Role, uh, proteins in general, in roles is kind of a, a bad word to use because 
I, it's so many proteins are so flexible. They have multiple uses. They can be changed slightly and suddenly it, they're playing multiple, you know, roles, whatever. But what is the function of proteins? Proteins do basically almost everything in your body. You know, proteins are responsible for giving your spit the consistency that it has. It's responsible for you not being just a gelatinous mass made of water and some other minerals. You know, proteins are what make you up. Protein is not just, you know, something you have in your diet. This is something crucial for enzymes are proteins. That's one of the ways that early life actually made its cytoplasm more hospitable. It lowered the necessary energy that many chemicals require to react. And so by lowering that activation energy, they act as natural catalysts. So your body, if it can produce a catalyst and reduce the activation energy needed for a chemical reaction, that is a survival benefit. But how does that survival benefit come about? Now, evolutionists pose that this all came about through a completely random process of natural selection. That bacteria in their fundamental nature or the earliest prokaryotic life, the earliest life we can think of, the earliest prokaryotes, even the simplest bacteria have ribosomes. Even the most basic life that we can find has a way of synthesizing proteins and none of them are simple. Not a single one of them involve any sort of randomness. These are highly organized processes within the cell that, that display irreductible complexity. Even though the units are simple, how do you get three different varieties of RNA, one of which is completely dependent, in fact, all of them are completely dependent on the actual DNA itself encoding for this, how do you get that functioning as a singular apparatus by natural selection? It's mind-boggling. In fact, if you look at a GIF of the ribosome, you know, twerking and functioning, I'm not, I'm going to spare you uh, <laughs> the split screen, just, you know, absolute horror show that, that's appearing before me. But this, in, this is a complicated and very much mechanical process. I was really debating whether or not I should have talked about motor proteins that literally walk parts of your cells along, you know, microtubules. Or if I should have gone for like the flagellum or something. And I'll, I'll talk about those later too. Other forms of irreductible complexity. But this is a universal form of irreductible complexity that cannot be explained by random occurrence. Cannot be explained by mixing up molecules in a laboratory and, and suddenly creating life. In fact, in science, we have yet to create life in the lab. You know, we can create phospholipid bilayers and surround them, um, you know, with, with RNA that we synthesize. But there's no way to get around this very obvious fork in the road of if we create life in a lab will we actually be proving our argument will we actually be proving that life came about randomly or would it just reinforce the idea of intelligent design or would it just poke holes in this theory of darwinism now i did actually want to bring up uh this topic uh before it got too irrelevant in the stream and that's a very famous and very well-known experiment done by, um, well, a few scientists at this point. But I, I really kind of want to mention it uh, here. But the Richard Linsky E. coli experiment of 1998, or 1988, my bad. So Richard Linsky comes up with this idea that if he puts a colony of E. coli in a closed ecosystem or a closed culture and waits decades and decades that the random base mutation rate and changes to the genome will result in if not a microevolutionary phenomena at least some sort of macroevolutionary phenomena that displays or somehow reinforces this uh this notion of mutation leading to change especially interspecies change. And when he's discovered after literally trillions of iterations, you know, this is, this is an experiment that's, that's gone on at least three decades. And what he basically found was that mutation is not a positive or constructive process. He found that mutation within these bacteria where segments or nucleotides um, 
were d being deleted or replaced or duplicated or, or shuffled around, that these never really had genuinely positive effects. And that w a positive gene coming about um, is usually a tweaking of a regular gene or an activation of a pseudogene rather than the creation of entire genes, especially like, you know, polygenic or pleiotropic traits that require multiple alleles functioning. Um, most of the time, it is just a Mendelian one-to-one. -one. Other times, you know, it, it might not be. You know, it's very interesting, the, the interactions that uh, DNA has with the rest of the body. We don't even come close to fully understanding genetics, which is, I, which is why I think it's so funny that we've, you know, based so much on it, it even though we don't understand it that much. We, we just barely found out about epigenetics and all the stuff that goes on, you know, beside the, pro the, the DNA, not just within it. So it's... It's a, it's a field in its infancy, no matter what they try to say. But my point is, is that at the end of the day, you're getting a, a narrative of a to, a to Z that starts already on a very bad foot. You know, the Richard Lenski experiment proves that at least asexual reproduction is not sufficient to explain many of the processes that I'll be talking about in this series. There is no... Oh, gotcha moment. And suddenly, with enough iterations, we can come up with this ribosome that allow us to generate proteins. How do you evolve if you don't have the apparatus to allow you to evolve? Your, your DNA has to have this middleman of the ribosome to even create protein in the first place. You know, it needs to have the entire process of translation and transcription down already to AT in order to work. You could say, oh, well... Uh, free-floating viroids prove that, you know, single strands of RNA can self-replicate. But it doesn't explain what we see in the fossil record. We don't see single strands of RNA in the fossil record. We see fully functioning prokaryotes in the fossil record. We don't see these ribosomal subunits. And in fact, if we take, you know, bacteria, what creates a peptidoglycan cell wall? You know, even if it's a basic, okay, well, it doesn't have a, it, it's just, you know, this little tiny bacteria with uh with just basic cell with, with just basic um cellular membrane you know phospholipid bilayer um how does it do active transport where's the active transport channels how is it uh, allowing itself to uh actively transport materials into the cell you know where are those protein gates we're taking an at we all have it there's all these microbes have it even if you say that they didn't have it then where did they come from you know how do you explain through Darwinistic natural selection, the idea that mutation over plus time will lead to change, especially interspecies change, where is it? Where are these protein channels? How did they emerge? Because the ribosome has to come first. We can talk about the flagellum, but what creates flagellar components? The ribosome. The ribosome is the factory of our cell. Even if you look at the Golgi apparatus, the, oh, the, the rough endoplasmic reticulum also creates protein. So, but what, what's embedded in the walls? of the rough endoplasmic reticulum to generate these proteins. Again, it's the ribosome. You need at least three RNA units plus, plus ribosomal proteins to create and maintain a ribosome. How is that possible without ri ribosomes? In the it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? This is the biggest plot hole of Darwinian evolution as it applies to creating the first life. But the first life isn't just the story of the ribosome. It isn't just the discussion of, oh, well, you know, what's happening in our world that's leading to this? What, like, how, how could this be otherwise explained in a logical fashion? Do you, do you, oh, so you're saying that we should just believe in God? Are you saying that we should just throw everything out and have no explanation? What I'm saying is you have to very much reanalyze what you're saying. Because at this point, even the panspermia people who think that we, you know, all came from bugs on Mars rocks, those people already sound more credible than the people who think that everything just came together one day. Like, it's, it's sort of hard to sit here and genuinely pick apart this topic without already anticipating some debate you know some people saying oh maybe what well the, well the rna could have twisted itself up like a like a balloon animal or something and just worked one day like grug smash rock against against tough rock make sparks spark create fire 
Grug have big fire now. Grug make fire. Grug cook mini thing in fire. Grug make fire carrot. I don't care if that's your working theory. It doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry. Even when you rely on, you know, things like parsimony or parsimony, however you want to say it, to, to justify how you make your phylogenetic trees, then don't come at me with this completely BS, you know, oh, the ribosome just came from, you know, some Harry Potter tier spell or something. That it just, even, I mean, even that, it's just how do you explain how ri three different segments of RNA can come together, orchestrate themselves, and also somehow also have the proteins that are necessary to keep them that way uh, at the same time, have the R proteins that, that go along with all of these segments of RNA that create the ribosome how do you get them where did they come from how did they first emerge and how did this system operate flawlessly the first time it started you know every time i rev an engine on a on a chainsaw on a bike whatever i'm not trying to create the bike the same time i'm revving the engine yet that's exactly what modern academics and evolutionary biologists want you to believe this is the lie that they're feeding you this notion that Oh, wow, the entire world started, all of life came about from one cell. And we're all, you know, we all have one common ancestor that existed, you know, some 500 million years after the Earth cooled. It's such a miracle how this all happened. The chances of it happening is one in 50 kajillion billion or something. You know, they feed you this grandiose, like, you should be so surprised and utterly shocked that this happened. But that's not really making sense to me. Because when I first heard that kind of stuff from, like, the Carl Sagan's whatever, keep in mind, this is uh, four billion years ago. You know, like, this is not just some short distance of time. This is the oldest rock that we're finding with life in it. Uh, dog's barking. But this is the oldest life we can find with life in it. And they still have to have ribosomes. It's like, you can't get around this question. The origin of life and abiogenesis has to start with this question. And I, there's going to be many more irreductible um, complexities that I'm going to go over that will be more or less dissected br as brutally as this has. But with this, our story begins. Or rather, it continues. Because it's not only just that many of these people are talking about Oh, well, how did this happen? Da, 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 da. There's also another mystery we have to take into account before we get really into the Proterozoic, before we get to the 3.2 billion year mark uh, to the first photosynthesis. We have to start not just with the prokaryotic life, you know, not just with the mechanisms within them that led to what we have now, but also the origin of the eukaryote themselves. Where did the eukaryotes come from? This is actually a weird mystery in science because people have many explanations for where the eukaryote comes from and I don't much care for them. How do you get an organism that also surrounded by phospholipid bilayer, but it contains organelles? You know, it's something that is essentially a large bag of phospholipid bilayer with organelles in them. You could say, oh, well, it maybe it's just a uh, prokaryote that lacked a cell wall of some kind um you know even though even though we see with organisms that usually lack cell walls that eh, they're typically parasitic but we're, that's neither here nor there uh barring the fact that they have to survive in this very hostile ocean um or type it is basically all ocean at this point so they have to survive in this very chemically active ocean uh they have high amounts of uv the early life has no real ozone. I mean, maybe the ozone layer forming is a prerequisite, but we don't really know when the ozone layer formed. Again, it's one of those things that just don't really have the data to prove it. You just kind of shoot from the hip and hope that it sticks. But the origin of eukaryotes is another mystery in science. And I, 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 I want this to be a buildup, a slow buildup to the Cambrian explosion. This is... I want, to, I want people to know that the Cambrian expo explosion was not the first time that mass radiation events happened that were unexplained. This jump from the single cell prokaryote to the eukaryote under a model that we see uh, with Richard Linsky's experiments, 30 years of data is a huge 
amount of data. That is trillions of cellular division, almost an unfathomable amount of growth has occurred in that period and it's all been recorded. It is extremely difficult to say that anyone else besides Linsky, uh, maybe if they undertook a similar experiment with different circumstances, maybe, would have the same results. Because what people misunderstand about evolution, they're like, oh, it's a closed ecosystem and nothing's changing. There's no environmental pressures. Microevolution is not macroevolution. Microevolution is observable and testable science. Macroevolution is an ideology LARPing as science. Microevolution shows us that animals will select for alleles that are already within the population if it, it confers a survival advantage. This is why people and scientists don't understand lecking behavior, how you can have all of this phenotypic polymorphism in, in species that, for all intents and purposes, due to, due to sexual selection, should be becoming less and less diverse. Like, oh, well, obviously, the males of the, of the greater sage grouse should obviously, like, they should... Wow, they should just all start looking big and beefy and just get as big as possible because of sexual selection. But that's not what we see. You know, we, we see in all kinds of different species this liking behavior that results in polymorphism. Males that are segregated, like look at, um, let, let's say, let's, let's take a, a species like turkey. Like there are the major males and the subordinate males. But in liking species, you could even have males that mimic females just to get mating access. Satellite males that kind of hang around and whenever a dominant male dies or something, it's like they're almost decided that from birth, but they still get occasional access to females, pass on their genes. But that's not enough to explain the behavior. You'd think that, oh, well, the females obviously go after these very buff bu and, be and beefy, uh, calling jubilant, um, jubilant males and somehow some way these babies keep getting born you know they aren't successful enough mating to where all of this carefully crafted ethology sort of falls apart and people are not and aren't really sure why it happens but this is one that's pretty big how the eukaryotes came about is one of the biggest mysteries of the archean eon and why i wanted to talk about the archean after i talked about the hadian in truth like i said because of how old the rocks have to be, not much is really known about Haiti and Earth. In fact, a lot about the Great Bombardment, the formation of our Earth, I covered that in our last installment, and it clearly demonstrates that, again, we don't have the rock, it's so old that we don't have the rock from that time. Um, especially assuming that we glean anything from, uh, from rocks that have now subducted into the mantle, it's hard to even say, like, what really goes on inside the Earth. I mean, I could get that deep. I could literally go so deep that I could, you know, talk about what's inside the earth but honestly i want to focus on life the origin of the eukaryotes involves a, a complete restructuring of the morphology of the anatomy of every single aspect of the cell it is not just some rinky dink expansion of the cell it, it involves the possession of organelles and even though we see endosymbiosis in from like mitochondria we can see it happen in real time with certain amoeba the, the amoeba and whatever, cl the closest related, pro it's like, this is why we, we put eukaryotes in their own king. It's, there's a basic separation. There's the domains of life. And it's like bacteria, eukarya, and archaea. It's one of the earliest divisions of life that we know of. One could possibly see a distinction like, oh, maybe the line gets blurred between bacteria and archaea, maybe. But eukaryotes? How do you get the first eukaryote? Where does the first eukaryote actually come from? Where do you get a, a cell that has a not only expanded fossil bilayer with actogen? It's like the, the eukaryote is, and every, many scientists say this very openly, a, a much more complex organism than a prokaryote is. And only the mitochondria... I mean, we're, we're, I mean, like later you'll get, you know, different plastids, like you'll get the chloroplasts getting integrated, like cyanobacteria get incorporated into eukaryotes and bada bing, bada boom, these cyanobacteria, uh, you know, they kind of incorporate themselves in the cell. They, they, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. And what do you get? You get the first algae, basically. Um, then there's secondary symbiosis and even tertiary symbiosis. But at the same time, we can see, okay, this can happen. 
But all these organelles in eukaryotes are endemic. They were created by the cell. They're part of the cell. Um, they're actively created through the processes I told you about. They're protein synthesized. Something had to synthesize all of those organelles, the Golgi apparatus, the endoplasmic reticulum, both smooth and soft, the nucleolus and the nucleus, and all those microtubules and microfibules that are within the cells, the centrioles that allow the cells to divide, and also all the cellular acumen necessary for a eukaryote to divide, to go through its PMAT, its prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, spin it out. How do you get PMAT? What, when does the first PMAT happen? What prokaryotic cell, um, you know, mastered that on the first try? Oh man, I got my phospholipid bilayer everywhere, and oh, I got my, I got my Golgi apparatus. I, so, I, I can use my ribosomes that came from nowhere to create all of this stuff around me. I have all my furniture, and now I need to divide. If you if you quickly look up how do how do you eukaryotic cells divide? It is not just PMAT coming out of nowhere. There have to be specific hormone triggers that happen within the cell, chemical impetuses. Oh, I gotta grow! I gotta grow! I gotta grow! Oh, I gotta copy my DNA! Oh, I gotta, you know, I gotta restructure my microtubules. So I gotta make two poles in my centrioles, and then I gotta reorganize everything. And then, oh my! I gotta basically lice open my nucleus. All the uh, chromatin and, and chromos all the chromosomes have to consolidate, and then they have to line up, and then all this interchange happens, and then I have to get pulled apart in two parts of the cells, and then it has to pinch off together, and then there's two cells. How does that happen on the first try? You know, that's, that's an incredible process that I just summarized in one autistic rant, but that is the level of complexity that we're dealing with. It is so mind-boggling and complex that even in the in the seemingly intense barrage of what I gave you is still an extremely summarized version of what's going on. And somehow, in some way, we're kind of just being lulled into this false sense of, oh, yeah, man, that's exactly what happened, bro. Totally. You, you should just totally believe that 100%. There is nothing wrong with this. That's exactly how it happened. Are you dumb? Like... This is seriously the kind of stuff that we're dealing with here. And I'm sorry to say that, I mean, can, can you really, can, I, I just have trouble and I've always had trouble believing that, you know, I've never had an easy time genuinely believing any of this. And I think one of the reasons that I do have an issue believing it is solely because it just doesn't make sense in a logical in a logical sort of argument. No one can logically sit here and, and argue like where did the RNA come from if it didn't come from you know some miraculous event like can you explain to me scientifically how this came about? Because now it opens the door to all of these other arguments that you called ridiculous that you called you know unscientific. Oh you you say it's oh this is for idiots or the ignorant. But even the most wackadoodle argument you can come up with, whether it is a religious argument, whether it is a, a panspermic argument, or you say, oh, we were created by aliens, all of that is as equally as plausible as this completely unfounded and ridiculous notion that life came from absolutely nowhere, that the ribosome was just a miraculous, happy accident that occurred where... The proteins necessary to make up the RD, uh, the, the, you know, just the, the ribosomal protein mass and the two massive subunits of RNA that had to make it up and the messenger RNA coming in there, the tRNA, which was attached to the amino acids perfectly, that waltzed in, it all just came together. But what was all that doing before? It's like they can't even explain the use of tRNA before the, the existence of mRNA. So what had to come first? It all had to happen at the same time. There'd be no point of having tRNA if there was no mRNA. There'd be no point of having mRNA if there was no tRNA. You feel me? But even then, even if it was just like, oh, well, there was no ribosome, it was just <laughs> tRNA and mRNA interacting with the amino acid chain, 
then I'm like, okay, okay, well, the entire reason the ribosomes exist is to house that, you know, reaction, to, to make it happen in the first place. It is the machine by which this interaction happens. The tRNA interacts with the mRNA only because of the two ribosomal subunits themselves called R DNA, or rRNA, R squared NA, basically interacting to shelter and house this interaction. And you'll see this is an energetic reaction. It takes ATP to do protein synthesis. Obviously, it's not energy neutral. It just won't, doesn't happen on its own. Where does the energy come from even? Because that's what I mean. I'm not, you know, pulling the cord on the chainsaw and building the chainsaw at the same time. This has to be simultaneous. You not only have to have these proteins on standby doing nothing yet, made for no reason, and then suddenly have it all come together and the energy applied, and then it starts. So the energy is applied the same time that it's created, or they all were just floating around in the cytoplasm doing nothing, and then suddenly, bam, all comes together, fam. First ribosome. Okay, so cells have to have the cellular machinery necessary in their DNA to be able to translate that into a messenger RNA and then get it, or transcribed and translated, whatever, and have that complex interaction with the ribosome once the ribosome forms. And it all has to happen flawlessly on the first try, on the first go of it. Because how else is it going to happen? You know, we have to ask ourselves statistically, how likely is that to occur? So that's our first kind of obstacle here. Um, asexual reproduction does not really explain the base mutation rate that we see with the planet. And for this segment, I, I want to kind of wrap it up with discussion of another phenomenon that, again, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You know, I, I banged on a lot about the ribosome. I banged on a lot about kind of heavy stuff in terms of cellular machinery. But now I want to wind it back out and kind of talk about something else that I think is important. And that's the snowball Earth. The other big whoop to do that happened, I think, what did scientists say, 600 million years? I have to I, actually let me let me quickly make sure that my my facts are straight, unlike most scientists. Um I'll see what uh what they have on ResearchGate. I want to avoid Wikipedia. So the Snowball Earth, if people don't know about this, I'm not I'm not going into this completely dry, but it was a it was something at the Neoproterozoic that essentially was used to explain why certain uh, sedimentary rocks at the equator seemingly had de depositions that mimicked those of known glacial rock or post-glacial rock uh, where sediments in these glaciers after melting settled in a particular pattern that very closely resembled uh, that of known glacier deposits. So in 1992 Caltech geophysicist Joe Kirschfink said that uh, from a vantage point in outer space the planet would have looked like a giant snowball and uh, that's basically what they kind of used as the impetus to sort of roll with it. You know, this one guy from Caltech was sort of the brainchild of this. It's just like when John Money uh, created the gender-sex dichotomy in 1955 out of thin air. This guy also created the Snowball Earth Theory, uh, or at least named it. But here's the issue. So about 720 to 660 million years ago, in a period called the Sturtian. And also in another one, the Maranoan from 645 to 640. But let's just focus on this raid. Uh, the Ediacaran uh, is the is another one, 580. But let's just say in a period between 420,000 and 580 million years ago, there were at least two different uh, supposed mass glaciation events on Earth that basically happened during the Proterozoic, ice so cold that it basically froze around the planet. And I know that some people already um, 
you know, they point out, oh, there's striations in the rock. And that there's depositions. Definitely, we know that there were there was some kind of glacial activity. We, we know, uh, that, oh, we see this dichotomy between the tillite and pre-snowball bedrock and in places like Norway or whatever. I think it's in, what, is it, what do they say, Smjallford, whatever. There's also tillites and diamosites. They're talking about all of this rock. But what's funny is this is a very common thing in science. Instead of using Occam's razor, instead of trying to find, you know, oh, well, all of these stones, oh, there's drop stones and this and that. But instead of going the rational route and trying to say, okay, well, what if there's a logical explanation to all of this that doesn't involve the entire planet freezing over? Because one of the first issues you run into in a snowball Earth scenario is the very hard to explain energy cost in unfreezing the Earth. In order to freeze the entire planet, there is a runaway snowball effect. Glaciers with high albedo, reflecting sunlight into space and cooling the entire planet to the you cannot unfreeze the Earth in a positive snowball Earth scenario in which the planet just slowly freezes and freezes and freezes and freezes until the entire surface is frozen solid. First of all, there's a couple e reasons why that doesn't happen now. Uh, people talk about greenhouse gases, whatever, but they don't talk about what happens to ice as you freeze it. Ice, with the more saline it gets the lower and lower it's freezing point as you freeze water ice that makes the water around it even more saline which means that ice at the poles like this is what actually causes our oceanic currents you have denser more saline water sinking downwards and moving along the sea bottom as less saline water comes rushing in to take its place. This causes a belt effect that essentially creates the currents that we have now. That's how that Atlantic current that makes sure that Ireland doesn't have the weather of Manitoba. Keep, we're keeping it running, just keeping things held down. Those oceanic currents are caused by the interaction that sea ice has with sea water. Now, scientists ignore this and kind of in their own theory, have to explain how the Earth got that cold. The greenhouse effect is not some scary big old boogeyman, uh, regardless of what any scientists say. Uh, it's a, it is a natural phenomenon. Cli the climate always changes. Climate change is not, whether they want to say it's anthropogenic or not, is irrelevant. It will always change. Whether humans here, humans not here, doesn't matter. If it was Grug instead of Bill Gates, it would not change a thing. Now, there's a difference between, okay, pollution, over-harvesting, whatever. I'm not going to get into that. I'm very much on the side of conservation. In fact, I want to be a conservationist. But that's not exactly ex explanation for what's going on in the Neoproterozoic. So you have all these cells. These basic, oh, so primitive cells. These cells that, oh, man, they're running through. And I know, I know we've now jumped from the Archean over to the Proterozoic. There ain't a lot that happened during that time. Um, some big leaps, and then nothing. Funny how that sort of just happens. Oh, we suddenly got photosynthesis, and then, you know, not, not much going on, at least from what we can see in the fossil record. Another thing I'll bring up, um, but the fossil record does not glean very much, and the older you get, the less you get. So the uh, fossil record is very sparse. That's why I don't like cherry-picking the fossil record to make points, unlike modern scientists. But here we go into this little shenanigan. Uh, many people actually came out and said that maybe it was a slushy Earth. There, was ish there are issues with the snowball Earth theory. One is that, uh, oh, well, this could be just localized. You know, this could be a result of the Earth cooling, but maybe these deposits, you know, maybe these rocks just ended up in place maybe you know may, perhaps there was another explanation maybe it's just a slushy earth maybe there was only um occasional uh, ice deposit or maybe there's just something going on in, all, in general that you know explains some of this phenomenon like you know uh an earthquake 
can cause drop stones. You know, things can fall through strata through the liquefaction of the substrate. That doesn't require glaciation. And, oh, certain stones forming? Well, that doesn't mean anything. Stones can be moved around by oceanic processes. Maybe they were just washed up. Maybe there was a glaciation event. Uh, maybe on a further north latitude, those stones were washed down or something deposited them, or maybe they were just formed in a different way. Like maybe, who knows? But to say the entire Earth froze solid multiple times to explain this phenomena, purely geologic phenomena, by the way, we don't, you know, we still have life today. Is Obviously, life survived being frozen, going from essentially extremely warm tropical conditions to being frozen solid didn't eradicate almost all life on Earth. But this is in the Neoproterozoic. This is not in the Archean Eon. You know, these, this is life as we know it. I don't know if, if this is a tenable sort of thing. Because how do you unfreeze the Earth? How do you get the energy necessary to stop the, pos the positive feedback loop that led to this Earth's condition? If all the albedo from the sun is being reflected away, and that was the process that caused the snowball Earth, how do you get out of it? Volcanism causing greenhouse gases doesn't cut it for me. The amount of energy necessary to unfreeze the entire planet would be actually astronomical. You would need constant planetary bombardment from meteors to even hopefully get the Earth to have the energy necessary to unfreeze. It is an energy deficiency. If you had the entire Earth frozen, there is almost no energy in the ecosystem. It is so devoid of heat and energy that everything froze. So how do you get the Earth unfrozen, refrozen, unfrozen again, refrozen, then unfrozen again multiple times between 720 and 580 million years ago? That is the theory they're running with. To explain purely geological phenomena that could potentially also have other explanations. There are other more sound explanations than the snowball earth hypothesis. And it's called a hypo it's not even a theory. There's no science involved. It is pure conjecture invented by wishful thinking geologists who honestly shilled this, wrote it as a scientific paper and presented it to the public like, yo, what's up? The earth froze solid three times, homie. It doesn't work. I, I don't know why people buy this garbage. It's not science. It is an untested hypothesis that they are presenting as the truth, telling you is the truth, and daring you to say anything. There was no snowball earth. Nigga, that is bullshit. There was no snowball earth. They can try and prove it, and I'd love to see them try, because until they answer that, they can... It took them, you know, oh, they had to make up the Younger Dryas impact to explain how the Younger Dryas ended the Ice Age. Like, oh, how did all that energy enter the ecosystem? The Earth is not a fully closed environment. There, there's energy input happening from the sun. But if that energy input is going away, there's nothing differentiating us from Pluto. Where did that energy come from? I do not believe that volcanism and greenhouse gases are responsible. Because that should that same process should have stopped the snowball Earth in the first place. There's no shortage of greenhouse gases in the Neoproterozoic. But somehow, some way, somehow, some way, we got out of it. Then got back in it. Then got back out of it. Then got back in it. Then got back out of it. Is, are they really trying to say that? Are they really trying to show this notion that, oh man? You just gotta believe us, bro. Look at look at the look at how the stones are sinking in the rock. Oh man, look at the type of stone we're getting. They're taking Okay, oh well the, the rock's different at these two different layers in deposits that we think are associated with glaciers. We don't really know. We just see the phenomenon. We don't really know the noumenon. So we'll invent this cockamamie harebrained theory once more. Another one, because we're in the Neoproterozoic, why not? That the Earth froze solid three different times to explain what we see in the geologic record. They unironically want you to believe that. They unironically want you to think that the Earth froze solid 
and thought itself three different times just to explain some basic geologic phenomena that they cur that currently just doesn't go with whatever they think about science. This is a consistent, this isn't just geology, this is a consistent trend in biology. Things are convergent when they don't work with a the theory. Things are obviously proof of relatedness when they do. Look at how they justify cetaceans being artiodactyls based solely on ankle morphology and some other basic convergences in their morphology that would just be scoffed at by anybody else being serious. It's like saying, oh, well, because the thylacine and the red fox have a similar skull shape, oh, who cares if there's a couple, you know, fossa in its palate? These are obviously related species. You, you would definitely say on the same lines that, well, if these fossils are fragmentary, or they have this and that, oh, well, it's clear that uh, the thylacine is more closely related to the, uh, to the wolf um, or to canids than it is to, uh, to Felix, even though it is a marsupial. You know, it's, a, it's for all intents and purposes, a metatherian. They, the, they separate in the early Jurassic. You know, the earliest marsupials, the earliest placental mammals, we see them in the, in the mid-Jurassic. Basically, that's how they've been uh, even before the dinosaurs went extinct, even before, uh, even before the uh, in-Jurassic mass extinction event that we saw in the fossil record. You know, I'm not, I'm not anti-science here. I'm not anti-fossil record. I will gladly use the fossil record to make points because the fossil record does not care about your narratives. The fossil record does not lie. But scientists do. How cetaceans, and I'm going to get to this later. This is going to be much more in depth. But that was just one example of scientists trying to make you believe the most ridiculous crap unironically and say that you're an idiot if you don't. Oh no, some, some sheep-like near-water grazer is the ancestor of all whales. That's It took just 50 million years for that to happen, sure. but So, that's what they want you to... They want you to believe these theories that they make up out of nowhere just because it makes them feel good. It's like, how, how much ethos we have. Look how much we're taken seriously by having letters after our name, by having papers published. Like, what does it matter? This guy's obviously BSing you. If, if, a, if a snake oil salesman goes and gets an ND and talks about, oh man, we're going to go and, whew, we're going to go and uh, sell this snake oil to the masses, which they've done before. Let's not, let's not, be, uh, let's not be mistaken here. There, there is some historical precedent to what I'm about to say. But it's like if some doctor goes out and like, oh, I'm going to go and lie to all these people about medicine. And I'm going to sell them a product that obviously uh, will not work for them. But I say it'll work because they're gullible idiots. And they'll believe me because I'm an MD. That happens all the time. All the time. People will fall for the most obvious BS and quackery. And they think that science is immune from quackery. That science is immune of ego. That there aren't people who are bought and sold. That there, there are people that aren't profiting off of whatever theory they come up with. They're over here trying to tell you what to believe and often times what they're telling you to believe is not scientific in the slightest again the snowball earth hypothesis isn't a theory but the theory of evolution is you know that's considered to be supported by scientific doctrine even though mass radiation events which we see are typical in the fossil record may be a result of that Oh, so uh, fragmentary remains I mentioned earlier? Well, it's funny how that happens. Literally, oh yeah, there's no life here, and there's every single life form ever um, past this one strata of rock. Every body plan, every, you know, significant detail. And I'm going to get into the Cambrian explosion next time. But for now, I just want to kind of mention uh, what all went down in the Proterozoic. You know, how... You did get some basic body, body plans, especially when you talk about um, the metazoans, those early life forms that, you know, oh, they kind of look like things we see today. Oh, they look a lot like hydrozoans or scyphozoans, or they, they look like, you know, nidarians. Uh, and maybe they are still those same nidarians. Maybe the nidarians are a super ancient lineage. Maybe we can see that metazoa as a as a general clade as a uh monophyletic group is just so ancient and unique but are they the, are they like the ancestors of all of these 
other creatures? Like, oh no, no, it was it was some some worm-like animal that gave rise to the core dates, and then there was Pikia in the Cambrian explosion. But just like these massive leaps of logic happened, you know, pre and post Cambrian. We also see that in the Proterozoic. We see that, you know, oh, okay, they were the first sort of like endosymbionts, and we can see how that happens. Even I can see how endosymbiosis happens. We can see it happen even in modern cells. We can induce it in modern cells. But the issue that I find, um, especially, especially here in the Neoproterozoic, the end of the Archean, this is a process where man, I can't even put into words how ridiculous a snowball earth theory is. I just, it takes, it took so much. When I first heard this, I never thought it would be taught in schools. I never thought that they would ever unironically present the snowball earth theory as actual science, and they have. It is easily one of the most ridiculous and honestly stupid theories, not, not theories, rather hypotheses, I have ever seen taken seriously in my life. It is like flat earth or tier in terms of how stupid and garbage it is. I cannot express my hatred for snowball earth theory enough, but if I'm to tie this all together, life bounced back, life found a way. Not only did life survive the snowball earth, it became more complex, but life after the snowball earth suddenly saw a minor increase in diversity. But let's remember Richard Linsky. Remember that 1988 E. coli experiment where asexual reproduction was insufficient to explain what happened. Well, it isn't just asexual reproduction that occurs in the Proterozoic. Of course, you have sexual reproduction. And that opens up another can of worms. You see, you know, allele frequencies change as creatures that, you know, previously only asexually reproduced, maybe asexually reproduced through budding, and also, you know, had sexual reproduction, reproductive methods. This is this increased, increased genetic diversity, not necessarily how many genes a creature had, but the inventory of genes that it could have. You know, two asexual lineages, which may be accumulated different mutations or whatever over time, there's a few things here and there, that could, that could help them, you know, that boosts their genetic diversity. That gives them more tools in the belt, and they basically can do well for themselves. And, you know, many asexual organisms also go through... Uh, Things like, uh, you know, their DNA changes. There's some diversity, but it doesn't increase at the same rate, and it doesn't maintain at the same rate. And it, if a lineage dies, an asexual lineage dies, there's no way for other members to get those genes. But it's funny, because many of those asexual organisms, eh, it's funny how, they, how they're not every single one of them is a completely different species. You know, like, there's asexual or, or organisms and lineages that, although fairly genetically diverse, are still recognized, recognized as the same species even after hundreds of millions of years. But that's neither here nor there. The main mechanism is sexual reproduction obviously changes the game because it now changes genetic frequency. But it's just deck shuffling. People don't, don't, people don't get this. You're shuffling a deck. The only reason the, the Richard Linsky experiment is so pertinent to this conversation is because it explains it doesn't matter what happens to your environment. That's, that's literally Lamarckism. To say that your environment has this massive in, uh, impact on your future descendants, like, no, you can't will yourself into suddenly becoming a eukaryote. You know, you, you environmental pressure does not explain interspecies evolution. The base mutation rate does. That is the mechanism for Darwinian evolution, not some, oh, this environmental niche opens up. The issue with this theory, the niche theory or whatever, is the, the idea that creatures will slot into a niche if it opens up. That if an o a niche becomes open, a species will just slot into it and slowly and learn to start exploiting it, uh, if, if not inefficiently at first, then wholesale. And this is also brings up another issue I have in modern science, the transitional species, which do also does not. There's no such thing as a transitional species. Uh, every species is adapted to its niche. We don't see species move between niches unless they hybridize and the hybrid tries to slot into the niche. This is often impossible and a reason that, you know, uh, outbreeding depression exists. Something I'll get into later uh, in, again, another installment. But this is why that exists. Creatures don't just slot into different niches. When the Gompatheres and Giants slots went extinct in Colombia, 
their niche wasn't exploited until Escobar's hippos escaped from captivity or were released from captivity. You did not see tapers, tapirs, you know, however D David Attenborough says it. You didn't see, you know, deer becoming adapted. It's like, no, you know, the tapir was right there. It could have, oh, maybe it could have gotten a longer trunk and gotten a bit heftier. Maybe it could have filled that niche that those gompathiers left. But they didn't. They just kept being tapirs. Okay, they went extinct. Oh, they went extinct like 10,000 years ago. Well, wouldn't even micro-evolutionarily speaking, wouldn't they want to adapt into that niche? You know, because look at the wolves. Look at what we did uh, via breeding microevolution to the wolf. You know, we, we made them into all kinds of different forms. We manipulated their genome, no mutations needed, into, all into a plethora of different forms in just that same time frame. You know, if, if, if people can say, oh, well, these species just, you know, one moment they're here, one moment they're not, is that not a blink of an eye? Like, we even look at the human species. They say that, oh, we've only been anatomically modern for 200,000 years. Do you know how short of a... Okay, so 1 20th of the time it took us to go from literal small brain, and I'm not even talking grug. I'm talking creatures incapable of spoken language. I'm, I'm talking creatures that couldn't articulate their arms to throw. I'm talking... You know, hairy apes that could stand on a cup on their two legs. It, even if you go back and it's like, okay, that process took one and a half million years and before we got to a, a semblance of what it means to be human. Even in that one and a half million year period. How do you get what you see before you now? When you have species like the coelacanth, when you have species like the frilled shark, when you have ginkgos that have remained morphologically and biochemically stable for tens, if not hundreds of millions of years, you know, how do you explain the rapid and sudden increase of the human brain over the course of just a couple hundreds of thousands of years into what we have now? A marked increase in brain capacity between a creature like Homo habilis and Homo sapiens, or Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, that is almost obvious from the start just looking at portions of their skull you can tell that they had smaller brains how how does something like an energy intensive brain just start increasing in size how does that come about it's like oh well they select for the big brain oh there's they're select it's an active breeding for for big brain oh big brain uh very very successful but Here's, here's the issue I have with that. You know, it's also very, it's a, it's a trade-off. It's energy intensive. And at the same time, it makes it dif more difficult to give birth. You know, now you have higher infant mortality, higher mortality for the mother. Now it takes longer for you to reach maturity and it's more energe energetically expensive. There's a large middle of the road where having a big brain in an environment with low amounts of food is not a benefit. The large big brain emerging is, again, something I'm going to probably get into towards the end of this series. But I'm going to come back to it because these same processes happened with early life. These same enigmatic questions occurred with the earliest multicellular organisms that we see. How multicellular organisms emerged from colonial organizations to having full-on tissues and organs... That's a bit... Now, I can see how it emerged. Like, I, I can see how a colonial organism will differentiate itself over time. But the main difference between a colonial organism and a, or, a, a, an actual, you know, creature with organs and tissues comes down to two different things. First is germ layers. You know, how the actual animal develops from zygote to morula, to, to blastula, then gastrula. How it basically divides and organizes itself. You know, we have three germ layers, for example, as we develop from embryos. Some just have two, others have no germ layers. But how we go from those germ layers to, you know, how and how they differentiate. Um, epigenetic triggers that tell a liver cell to become, or a stem cell to become a liver cell or a heart cell or a, you know, eye cell, whatever. 
and how those genes organize themselves, like the Sonic the Hedgehog gene, you know, orienting ourselves head to tail, you know, how our gastrulation ends up either being an anus or a mouth. Um, and us, it's the anus first. How all that forms, how all that consolidates is, uh, again, in and of itself a very complex process. But a form of it had to have happened in the Proterozoic to go from those earliest multicellular colonies. You know, we see multicellular uh, colonies with bacteria, um, biofilms or nothing more, like the, the film on your teeth. Those biofilms of plaque are nothing more than colonies of organisms. You can see it on an auger plate, a colony. Nothing but a uh, consolidation of microbes within an extracellular matrix. That's the base, as basic as you can get. So they'll extrude proteins and minerals and other, you know, cytoplasm, whatever. And they'll sort of, sort of build a mat or a, or a literal film uh, of medium that they, that they can basically exist in. An isotonic solution that is great for them. They can weather it out. You know, it's resistant to the elements. Um, destroying the biofilm destroys them. But if you don't destroy the biofilm, if you don't disrupt that, then it's not going anywhere. And it's great. That's how they've survived all this time. But the earliest biofilms and the earliest organized organisms, that's a process that takes some time. And the issue with this process is that at some point, okay, you can get into a organism mode. I guess you can get a basic organism. You can get uh, the what looks like a schwannocyte or a schwannozoa or something. Uh, very early basic organism. But you can't really get, at least in my mind, any explanation for this using the models that we have now. Even with sexual reproduction, the Richard Lenski experiment really demonstrates how this process being achieved solely through mutation of the genome is not very tenable. The chances of creating a fully functioning protein, especially, like I said, those ribosomal proteins, uh, any of the catalytic proteins you need for, you know, all of this new stuff that you have in these specialized cells, not only requires this new epigenetic machinery for the differentiation and um, kind of just direction of tasking, uh, it not only requires regulatory genes and all kinds of other just cellular components in general to even make sure that they can do these things. Like, what's the difference between cell? Like, what, what's the point of having all the DNA? Okay, the DNA holds gene templates. Or, you know, it's junk DNA that allows, you know, okay, we can keep the virus reservoir, whatever. But you still have to synthesize those proteins. You still, everything has to go down to make sure the liver cell is different than the heart cell. So how does that happen? You know, how does that happen? It's through a very complex chain of events that occurs early on in the cell. How a stem cell knows what to do, it's a very complex hormonal reaction. This is a process that is expected to be explained by just random natural selection, base mutation rates, creating new genes that perform these functions. Like you can build a factory and eventually all you have to do is turn the lights on. But that factory is a massive cost until those lights come on. Until the factory starts producing, it is a massive expense. You will spend millions of dollars setting up even a modestly sized factory. And in the game of life, which is day to day, that money is often not there or would be sorely missed. Why build machinery in the cell that does not work? Again, the theme of irreductible complexity comes in when it comes to the basic function of even the earliest and most basic of multicellular organisms. How the colony can differentiate into multiple tasks and do so through a process of random mutation is something that is insufficient to explain a lot of the diversification that happens in the Proterozoic. You can't, I mean, even look at, kind of relevant because I'm learning it in my classes, so I'm going to bring it up, but look at the life cycle of the jellyfish. Look at the jellyfish. Beautiful jellyfish. They don't just come out jellyfish. They don't just poop out other jellyfish through budding. They have to basically go through the same process of sexual reproduction that we go through. These medusa will eject sperm and egg from their gonads. You know, look under their sub-umbrella and you'll probably see a couple gonads 
spend now ovum and sperm. They then meet in the water column. They go through the process of, you know, they cleave up the little morulas. The zygotes become morulas. The morulas become, like I said, the blastulas, and then they gastrulate the whole nine yards. Uh oh. Oh no, they turned off the tank. What have they done to the tank? I think it slides out, but basically, they they get the morula. Then the gastrula, you know, but then they become something called a planula, planula larva. They're free, they're just free floating. And then what happens? Settle down. Then they're a kippostoma. Skippostoma becomes a strobula. Strobula breaks off. Yeah, an ephedra. Or an ephira, my bad. And that becomes the medusa. That entire process, considered one of the most basic and most primitive organisms on our planet, and yet has a life cycle in at least, at least, four stages. You could say, oh, there's a, you know, the gamete stage, haploid cells meeting in the water column, and then there's the, I guess, planula, the, the free-floating stage, it's basically plankton, settles down to the ocean and then there's the the polyp stage which includes the skipostoma and the strobula and then the medusa stage of course which inc includes the um uh the medusa basically it, it includes the the young and the old medusas that is extremely complicated and i'm not saying it was just an instantaneous jump i'm not saying that you know these are things that Oh man, it's it's all so simple. It's oh they're teaching it. The, what I'm trying to explain, and all I'm trying to explain, is that these are not cut and dry solved mysteries. These are not things that scientists know for absolutely certain. These are not phenomena that can be explained through basic biology, like these scientists are trying to have you believe. The mechanism of macroevolution itself. This notion that random changes to the genome over multiple generations, imperfect deletions, add additives, whatever to the cell, will lead to new changes and new phenomenon emerging. It's ludicrous. It is absolutely ludicrous, and the reason that it's ludicrous is because of experimentation showing that it's ludicrous. It is scientists failing to create life in lab. It's Richard Linsky demonstrating that base mutation rate usually leads to a deterioration of the genome. That mutation actually is not very much a good thing. That the negative reputation that mutation have, it has is actually earned because of the results of most mutation either being outright negative or neutral and even positive mutations only leading to minor changes in the overall genome. Oh man, now I have lactose tolerance and maybe wet earwax. That doesn't explain the diversification that we see in the Proterozoic, and it doesn't even come close to explaining what happened in the Cambrian. But that is a topic for next time. Ladies and gentlemen, I, with the jellyfish, will be bidding you adieu. Uh, it was very nice for many of you who had subscribed to my content for my appearance on the MGTOWN podcast uh, to come over here and to basically uh, watch my extremely cringe startup videos. But I hope that any of you who have sat through this very um, weird rant that you can come away with a brighter perspective. I'm not telling you to believe any sort of narrative. I'm not telling you to believe uh, that... I am 100% right on everything that I say ever. I just want you to think critically about the kind of stuff that you are being taught in schools, being shown in the news, being referenced to in media. I need you to know that these people don't have everything figured out the way that they say and teach that they do. Because it's not just that they're saying these things. It's not that just that they're uh, giving out the snake oil. It's that they're selling it. It's that they're charging money in consultations and in classwork they're they're basically making you pay to hear their cockamamie nonsense they do not have the facts and 
people saying that they do solely because oh man but they have letters after their names and oh man but they 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 were published by so and so i saw their thing in the journal nature whatever it doesn't matter because if they're coming out with stuff that makes no sense like snowball earth or coming up with nonsense like oh well the ribosome came from nowhere through random processes and that oh well uh, the creatures that led to like the first jellyfish or worms you know oh they were just clumps of free-floating colonial organisms that assembled themselves into perfectly functioning it's just it just doesn't make any sense and when you actually look at the mechanism of mutation and just random mutation it is wholly insufficient on the time scales that are that they, that these things are happening we don't see slow diversification in the fossil record what we see is fast diversification in the fossil record people constantly talk about how shocking it is that things happen so quickly well, this is what we see we don't see life just meander its way into the modern form much of the archaean and proterozoic was spent with much of the same looking organisms the entire time until suddenly bam you get the cambrian explosion and almost every single body plan if not every single body plan we see represented in the fossil record at this point in time and that's where i'm going to pick up because it's a crazy time honestly the cambrian explosion itself is a full-length stream on its own. I could spend hours talking about the Cambrian and still not even come close to encapsulating all of the miracle work that just went into the Cambrian explosion. It's still one of the most unexplained phenomena in science, probably second only to abiogenesis in terms of current theories just being out of the water in terms of what happened. Um, and just for kind of a plot for further episodes or installments, whatever, um, after the Cambrian explosion, I'm going to talk about the sea to land transition. This is a topic I've deliberately not mentioned in this stream because I know it'll just cause me to go off on a tangent like I almost did with a couple others. But this is a near and dear subject to my heart because it is something that I think is one of the easiest things to kind of poke holes with, but something that I can't do until I give the sort of groundwork that I laid out in this sort of episode. But so if anybody takes anything away from this again i hope it's just a more skeptical view of the current scientific narrative it doesn't mean completely reject everything you hear it doesn't mean ignore science it doesn't mean that science is irrelevant you know i'm not telling you to do really anything but think critically about what you're hearing if it seems like a crock of crap it probably is a crock of crap so take care y'all